Okay, cool. Well, welcome to the seminar in computer architecture. Uh, I hope you're here for this. And are you all bachelor students? Yes? Okay, great. I think there are 22 people registered because we limited the registration to 22. Last time we didn't limit the registration, there were more. But I think it's going to be a better experience this time because last time for a given lecture session we had three presentations for most of the time. Now we're going to have two presentations, which will give us more time to discuss, uh, hopefully brainstorm, generate ideas, and go deeper in each paper, whereas last time it was a bit rushed. Okay, so it'll be fun, hopefully. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's start, I think. So uh, in this, this time, I'm, I'm going to present, not you. You have no burden this time, except for thinking and asking questions, maybe. Uh, tomorrow, not tomorrow, next week, we'll also present. But I'll give you the schedule. Later, we'll start the presentations. I'll start with this, basically. Hopefully, you're here for computer architecture. I'll motivate things a little bit. Uh, and you've seen this before. How many people have taken uh, the digital circuits course? Okay, I see a lot of familiar faces. I guess, I guess I should ask the reverse question. How many people have not taken the digital circuits course? Okay, I don't see any hands. That's good. So you're already familiar with a lot of this. I can go fast. And you're already familiar with the pace too? Okay. <laughs> okay, I see. <laughs> Okay, uh, you, you know this basically, computer architecture is a science and art of designing, selecting and interconnecting hardware components and designing the hardware software interface to achieve some goals basically, to create a computing system. And there are many goals as we've discussed, I don't want to bore you with definitions. Uh, but you've also seen that an enabler is Moore's law. Uh, people claim that it's ending, uh, I tend to be a contrarian, I think it's not ending yet. It will end at some point, but it hasn't ended and I'll provide you some evidence from the field that it hasn't ended. Uh, although it needs to be proven that that evidence is good also. It hasn't proven itself in the market yet. But Moore's law essentially says that we can put more devices in a given area uh, and get good cost. Uh, and you can see this is an old picture over here, it goes on until 2005. Basically you can have many transistors on a chip and this is the original curve that Moore draw, uh, drew in his paper to show that, uh, to, to basically provide evidence for this conjecture, right? Have you, seen, have you read Moore's paper, original paper? I, I hear some. Who, who has read the paper? Okay, you don't need to be shy here, that's good, that's good. This was one of my suggestions in Digital Circuits. I'm glad some people have read it. You can still read it, it's only a three page paper as I mentioned, I, actually it's almost two pages I think. But basically, uh, it's still going. This is another picture that also has uh, that also Moore drew in uh, in his uh, seminal paper. This basically shows the relative manufacturing cost per component and the number of components per integrated circuit. You can think of this as transistors, for example. And you can see that there, the curve uh, has a Pareto optimal point, right? In 1962, the curve looked like this, and this is real data. Uh, and there's a Pareto optimal point, you can put some number of components and if you keep higher then the economics cost is higher. Uh, in 1965 the curve shifts to the right, in 1970 the curve is expected to shift to the right even more because he didn't have data for 1970 as you can see over here, right? Because the paper was written in 1965, as you can also see from here. Okay, so ba basically this is Moore's law, you can put more components on a chip and this, is be this has been a huge enabler for computer architecture. Now we can see these chips that are huge uh, and I think the, the biggest GPU is 21 billion transistors which doesn't even fit over here as you can see. This is, this is already an old uh, graph as you can also see from the date over here. But the, the fit is really well actually to this curve as you can see. Uh, okay, this is my recommended reading, it's only three pages. Uh, this is interesting to read. With the unit cost falling as the number of components per circuit rises, by 1975 economics may dictate squeezing as many as 65,000 components on a single silicon chip. We're well beyond 65,000. But uh, there, there are, it, it, does, it always comes at a cost. Everything comes at a cost and you know this very well from digital circuits. Clearly as you put more stuff, questions like this arise and Moore has predicted this question also. Will it be possible to remove the heat generated by so many components on a single chip. And we're dealing with these problems today actually in computer architecture. We may read some papers related to heat generation, heat removal, power management as well in this course assuming you select them. 
Okay, so uh, this slide I think you've already seen also. Basically, we want to enable better systems. That's why studying computer architecture is uh, a good idea. Because this is, by being a computer architect, you can make entire systems faster, cheaper, smaller, more reliable, dot, 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 more secure. You can ed uh, exploit advances and changes in computer uh, underlying technology and circuits, as well as applications. I think today, especially, we will see, we're seeing a lot of chips that are built for machine learning. And there's a good reason for it, because there's a huge demand for this application today, for good or bad, for many purposes, clearly. Uh, but those applications are driving uh, the computer architectures today, as well as underlying circuits and technology. They're also driving computer architectures, as, as I will show you uh, some evidence from the field uh, soon. Actually, you will see some evidence from the field that you didn't see in the spring semester, which also shows you how important things are becoming computer architecture. Uh, in the spring semester, there was we have a lot more interesting chips today in the field today. Well, they're being developed today that weren't there in uh, until May when we parted. Right? Okay. So these applications are important, and I think going forward we'll have a lot more, like self-driving cars, personalized genomics, personalized medicine. And clearly, applications enable better solutions to the problem, right? Uh, software innovation has been built on uh, these trends and changes in computer architecture for a long time. Uh, and especially when you specialize for an application, you get even more than 50%. General purpose domain, uh, we've experienced very high speed ups, like 50% performance improvement on average, let's say, per year. This is becoming much harder in the general purpose domain. But once you start specializing the chips uh, or architectures for an application, you get even higher performance improvements. And of course, there's another reason we want to understand why computers work the way they do. This is more of the scientific aspect, perhaps. Uh, even though this is called computer science, there's clearly a whole lot of engineering in computer science. But understanding why computers work the way they do is really the more fundamentally science part of it. Clearly, we're not in hard sciences in computer science, right? Uh, Okay, uh, so I think today is a very exciting time to study computer architecture uh, because we are in a large paradigm shift uh, to a novel architecture. There are many different potential system designs that are possible. I think you've already seen the slide as well, so I'm going to go through rel relatively quickly. Uh, and there are many difficult problems. There is a huge hunger for data and uh, there are many new data intensive applications. There are huge constraints at the uh, architecture level, power, energy, thermal, at the circuits level also. Complexity is a huge constraint also. Difficulties in technology scaling, which we've seen earlier, the Rohammer uh, work that you know of very well. Memory wall gap, reliability problems, programmability problems, security and privacy issues like Meltdown and Spectre that we've also discussed, right? You're already familiar with a lot of these actually by taking digital circuits, because the digital circuits course you took was uh, not a regular digital circuits course, it was more uh, forward-looking digital circuits course. I hope you liked it. I hope that's why you're here. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Because if you don't like it, it doesn't make sense for you to be here, probably. <laughs> okay, uh, so we're going to cover uh, the papers that we're going to select, that we're going to give you, that you're going to select from, will cover a lot of these issues, actually. And you'll have freedom to select, at least specify which papers you're most interested in. And the interesting thing is there is no clear and definitive answers to these problems today. That's why we're in a paradigm shift. Uh, and uh, basically, the, these problems affect all parts of the computing stack, actually, not just one part. So we really need to think across the stack. And the stack looks like this, basically. You have problems that we want to solve, and we want to enable electrons to solve the problems. As a result, we build this multiple levels of transformation. And I've kind of deconstructed this level of levels of transformation by including the user in it, because I would like people to think about how to have the user. Actually, I have a better graph that has the user interacting with many components over here. Thinking about how to uh, sp satisfy the user better at different parts of the stack will be important, I think, going forward. Uh, some of the examples of the stack don't have the user in it. But I think that's really important. Basically, today we have many new dems, demands from the top, lots of problems to solve. Data is a huge problem, and what to do with the data is a huge problem also. So a computer architect needs to look up, in the sense that examine the problems and understand them, and listen to the people who are trying to solve those problems in creative ways. And we also need to look down because there are many issues that we need to solve at the bottom, like issues like Rohammer, issues like Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, those are relatively new, and there, there should be new issues coming up as well. So we need to look down. We also need to look down and understand what are the emerging technologies. For example, let's assume that Moore's Law ends 10 years from now. What is the technology that you can use to actually satisfy all of the problems that we want to solve in the world? And the problems are not going to go away. 
they're going to become worse and worse, in my opinion. Sustainability is going to be an even bigger problem than today, 10 years from later, if you survive that long. I hope so. Uh, and that problem needs to be solved in some part by computing, for example. Uh, so this is really important also, that new, those new technologies. And there will be some papers that we will put up related to those new technologies, hopefully. And clearly, there is a, uh, you need to look up in the sense that you need to understand the users also, because there's, there are fast-changing demands and personalities of users, maybe too fast sometimes. Uh, and clearly, we don't have definitive answers to these problems today. That's why computer architecture has become even hotter today. And uh, as I will show you, give you some evidence, computing landscape is very different today compared to 10 to 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, even compared to last year when you took the digital circuits course. Well, it's not last year, last semester. Uh, well, not all of you took it last semester, but some of you took it last year. So last year, last semester, let's say it that way. So basically, there are a bunch of issues at the higher levels, uh, software applications in humanity, and down at the lower levels, technologies and their issues and also forward and backward in history, of course, and the resulting requirements and constraints. As a result, people are examining every single component, and I'm, uh, I'm not lying when I say this, it's really every single component that we knew how to design, we're really re-examining it today. Uh, and its interfaces, as well as entire systems. And I'll give you some evidence uh, very soon, actually, uh, in the next slide, starting from the next slide. But you can see that these are the parts of the system that we may deal with in this course. Of course, we'll be broader. There will be some parts that are not depicted over here. There will be papers that are at the larger scale also that you may select from. Okay, so let me give you uh, some things new. I think there, uh, it's, it's fascinating today because a lot of things happened in 2009, especially in the summer part of 2009. Uh, and I call these many interesting things happening in computer architecture. And I'll give you some examples. This may not be summer 2009, this may be earlier actually, I, I mentioned this in uh, the class, but this is an interesting thing that has happened. This is Intel's 3D X-Point technology that wasn't there before. Now you can take this, put it in your computer, and you have non-volatile memory. This wasn't there for decades and decades and decades, right? It's based on, well, Intel doesn't admit it public, publicly, but the evidence points to the fact that this is very, very likely phase change memory, which we will have readings on. And you can buy it, and you can see that it's 120 gigabytes, which is reasonably large. And it's expected to get even larger and larger and larger, because it's a much more scalable technology than DRAM technology. Uh, and if you select some of those papers, some of those rate papers that originally looked at architectural designs to take advantage of this technology, they were published in 2009. I co-authored one of those papers, and two other papers were presented in the same session, in ISCA 2009. So you can see a 10-year gap. Clearly, the research was done actually earlier than 2009 because publication means that you've done the research for two or three years before at least. So it's, it, it takes 12 years, 13 years to adopt the technology. But this is a revolutionary technology, in my opinion, because now you can have persistent memory, persistent storage, accessible at close to DRAM latencies. Now take that with a grain of salt because people have done studies in this device and they don't see as close to DRAM latencies. But it's much better than storage latencies, that's for sure. But I think as the technology evolves, this will become closer and closer to DRAM, in my opinion, if people do the right things to enable that. Again, those enablers will be computer architects, right? Okay, this one example. Did people see this before? I assume so, right? Has anybody, anyone used it? Not yet, it's too expensive. It's a bit expensive still, but the costs are going to go down, don't worry. When Flash was introduced the first time, it was also expensive. But today, Flash is one of the cheapest technologies, right? Okay, that's another example in 2009. Has anyone seen this one? Who has seen this one? Okay, no one. Interesting. This is, uh, this is a, a machine learning accelerator. We talked briefly about that in digital circuit design, right? But this is one machine learning accelerator that was introduced uh, in August by Cerebra Systems and you can see that this is a wafer scale chip basically they they basically uh, questioned everything and they decided to go with this approach why because they figured out uh, they needed a lot of computation uh, if you want to train very large machine learning models you need a lot of computation and you need a lot of memory how do you get both in a single chip well you make the chip bigger and that's essentially what they did. Now you have a wafer scale chip that has a lot of computation capability and that has lots of memory. And it can train very large models with this one. Of course, this remains to be seen if it's going to be successful, right? We don't know. This is just introduced 
people are trying to experiment with it, make it work. Uh, but you can see that it's 1.2 trillion transistors. And the largest GPU so far has been 21 billion transistors. Why? Because we've limited ourselves to these small chips. And the out-of-the-box thinking says maybe we should not think about small chips. Of course, nothing comes for free. You know for, we know that from digital circuits, right? Clearly, there are trade-offs between these two st styles of architecture. Uh, how do you power this up? How do you handle the fault issues, the yield issues that you may have? One of the reasons why we chop things into smaller, finer grain chips is you get a lot of issues in the wafer. You may have reliability issues and you get rid of some of those reliability issues. Now all those reliability issues will be present in this chip. How do you handle them? Now Cerebus suggests that they actually have solutions to that, but we don't know of any public information. And how do you power this up? I said that I think. Uh, how do you take the heat out of this chip, this huge one? Those are all good questions. But I think this is fascinating in the sense that somebody actually was bold enough to do it. And why did they do it? Because there was uh, the applications are really pushing people to do different things today in architecture. I don't think this was imaginable 20 years ago when I was studying architecture in the late 1990s, for example. The paradigm was you have a single core processor, general purpose, highly, pi highly pipelined, let's say, uh, all of the things that we've discussed in digital circuits, out of order, superscalar, wide issue, wider pipelines, everything becoming bigger basically in a single core and that's the paradigm. But this is a very different paradigm as you can see. First of all, it's not general purpose, it's specialized for machine learning acceleration and clearly it's, it doesn't obey, uh, it doesn't follow any of the principles of the out of order superscalar paradigm that you've seen a lot in the previous course. Okay, so I think this is fascinating. You can read some uh, things over here. I don't think we can present papers related to this, unfortunately, because they haven't written papers yet. And it remains to be seen if it's going to be successful. So another example that wasn't there when you were taking uh, digital circuits is this one. This, uh, this was announced at Hot Chips also this year in August, just like the previous chip that I showed you. This is essentially a processing in DRAM engine. Uh, uh, what these folks have done is they put uh, processors inside a DRAM chip, relatively general purpose processors, they call it the data processing units. And this is a standard uh, memory module, so you can plug it into any computer, presumably. And there's a programming model associated with it, which is hopefully not that bad, but you have to fit your applications to that programming model to be able to take advantage of the large amounts of compute and memory bandwidth that's coupled together inside the memory chip. Again, this is fascinating. I think this was not there a few months ago, although it was being built, developed a few months ago, it was not there publicly. Uh, so this shows you that there's a lot of churn that's happening, questioning the, uh, what the paradigm should be in computer architecture. And there's going to be more and more of this that's going to happen. Uh, when I was studying computer architecture in 1990s, for example, there were always questions, why are you studying this thing? It's not important at all. And I didn't believe any of that, of course. That's why I studied computer architecture. <laughs> but I think here, uh, right now, we have clear evidence that why it has become a lot more important. Uh, and I think this is not going to change for a really long time. Unless we fundamentally change to a completely different technology that puts us back into the curve that we were in and we could still design these single core or whatever paradigm processors without changing the software much. And what, what is common between this, this, and this is they're all hardware software co-designs. You cannot just expect existing software to run on them. And you have to work on both hardware and software to enable uh, things to run on them very, very efficiently. For example, you have to orchestrate the data movement over here. That's true for GPUs also, clearly, right? But for a machine learning accelerator, you have to do that as well. So it's really hardware software co-designs going forward. Okay, this is another example. I think I, I mentioned this actually. This is maybe not as new. Uh, the, the, the video I mentioned, I remember mentioning in the Digital Circuits class, uh, you can watch it, it's a, it's a very nice video covering uh, Tesla's chips. Uh, and this is another machine learning accelerator that they use for whatever they, use, they, they do in self-driving cars. And that's a, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done there. And you can see that that has a reasonable amount of transistors, it's not small, but comparatively to 1.2 trillion, I guess it looks small now. <laughs> it's like more than, I don't know. Well, it's a lot smaller, I guess. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> now, I, I guess once this becomes a standard, uh, people will forget about these chips, right? That's the interesting part. That's how technology evolves, right? And clearly, this will come at a cost. And we will talk about that in a little bit. 
Okay, but, but this is Tesla's accelerator. And you can see there are some fundamental principles. This is a heterogeneous system. It's not just a machine learning accelerator. It has a GPU. It has a bunch of cores. So it's really a heterogeneous system. Uh, but of course, the accelerator is really important. And it's not, again, this is also hardware software co-design. There's a compiler for it. You need to program for it. So you cannot take advantage of it unless you really understand computer architecture and the hardware software interface. And there is also the fundamental principle of redundancy that they built in for better safety that they market, I guess. Uh, you have two chips so that if one fails, you can use the other one. Or you can do redundant execution of the same program in both chips and then check the results and find out uh, if something is going wrong. It's fascinating, isn't it? Okay, maybe not as fascinating as the big wafer. <laughs> Okay, I mean, you've seen this already in the class, so I'm not going to talk about this one. Clearly, this was the earlier generation, right? Before these were present, I used to use this one to motivate. And before this was present, I used to use systolic arrays when there were no machine learning accelerators. And you already had heard that story. That's why architecture is so fundamental, because now you know the systolic arrays and the systolic nature of computation is used in a lot of these chips. Okay. And this was generation two that you also saw in the previous class. And you can see that everything is becoming bigger and uh, well, not just computation, but also memory. And in fact, I believe the Cerebras chip is designed the way it is because not, not just of computation. If you want to train very large machine learning models, that's a very data intensive process. You really need to have a whole lot of memory. And uh, I believe those folks asked the question, how do we get lots of computation and memory in a single chip? And they made that design decision. Of course, if you were um, maybe doing DRAM, you could make the design decision some other way, but I haven't seen as much forward-looking thinking from those DRAM companies at the moment. If they're listening, they can take, <laughs> uh, maybe they can think about that. But if this, this kind of forward-looking bold leaps are really interesting, I think, like Cerebras. And this is also putting a lot of computation and memory together, but maybe not to the same extent uh, as, as that chip that was introduced. Okay, and you all, or you, we already went through this. If you are really interested in uh, revising uh, your memory, you can look at the uh, systolic arrays uh, lecture from Digital Circuits. I have these pictures over there. Okay, basically, there, there is a large number of new concepts that are being investigated today, new computing paradigms, and I can now point to real chips in, well, real chips that are designed but not necessarily proven themselves in processing in memory. That's true for neuromorphic computing as well. Although the, there's a difference here, processing in memory right now is more trying to be commercialized, whereas neuromorphic computing is still in the uh, research phases, I, I believe. But new accelerators, clear there's a huge demand for many different, from many different domains, machine learning, graph analytics, and genome analysis, and new systolic architectures, and clear new memories. Even though I put them last over here, they're not the least. And as a result, the computing landscape is very different from 10 to 20 years ago, even maybe a few months ago, uh, at least publicly. <laughs> right. And applications and technology both demand novel architectures, and I've already said this, so I'm going to skip that. And I think you've seen the slide also, but basically, I, uh, this is really uh, fascinating to me. All of those designs are hardware software cooperative, and I think people are trying to really revolutionize something uh, in the designs today. That's why we're seeing all of these designs. And clearly, whenever you want to revolutionize something, things come at a cost, right? None of the chips that I just showed you are free. You need to pay for them. They're expensive. In fact, that Cerebras chip, I think, is going to be very, very expensive in terms of how you need to deal with power, reliability, uh, and thermals. Uh, all of them, uh, in, in addition to the fact that it's a huge chip that is expensive by nature, there's also amplifying effects in terms of how much cost that's going to be added onto that chip to make it work. So whenever you want to change the paradigm, you really need to not think about the cost. And you've already seen my slides uh, from Call Java, for example, right? That talk about how Oculus cost $4 billion. I'm not going to go into that again, but this is exactly how things are changing right now, I think. Okay, and I, as a result, I think by studying computer architecture, you can invent uh, many, many new things. And I've talked about this book uh, last time in Digital Circuits. Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. How many people have read it? Okay, Moore's paper was easier to read, probably. This is a bit harder to read. But I would definitely recommend reading it, frankly. It may not be easy, as easy to catch, uh, but it's beautiful. Uh, like pre paradigm science, there is no consensus in the field. Normal science, there is a dominant theory. Dominant theory 20 years ago was single core processors. Today, that dominant theory doesn't exist. So we're somewhere in this revolutionary science. We're, we're re-examining all of the underlying assumptions of every single component that we built. 
And this is similar to uh, one of the examples in this book is, for example, uh, does the Earth revolve around the Sun or does the Sun revolve around the Earth, right? Well, th the thinking was the Sun revolves around the Earth for some time. But that changed. How did it get changed? People started poking at it with evidence, right? Saying that this theory doesn't hold. And at some point that theory did not hold and broke completely. And apparently it was the wrong theory in this case. Now, we're not in hard sciences. Because that's, there is a complete clear truth or wrong in that case, right? Well, I guess you could question that still also, but you, you may need to provide a lot of evidence <laughs> against Earth revolving around the Sun. Uh, but in this case also we have a similar thing, I think. Single core systems, they're all fallen right now. Even though they're important, they're really only a part of the puzzle. They're not the dominant paradigm. Okay, so I would still recommend reading that book. And if you don't like it, you, don't, you would like the Kindle version. This is an old Kindle. Okay. Okay, so the takeaway, I think it's an exciting time to be understanding and designing computing architectures. There are many challenging problems that no one has tackled or thought about before. The wafer scale engine, for example, I think is going to open up many other problems that people have not thought about before because they assume chips are much smaller. And these can have huge impact on the world's future. And I think these are driven by many things, right? One is certainly these applications, in the new applications, even greater push for realism, hopefully a better future. Uh, uh, I, cannot, I cannot really watch for the motiv motivations of different people who are de developing different applications, but if used for good, these can be good. Right? And clearly we can collect more data than we can analyze and understand. And also there is an underlying part that's driven by significant difficulties in keeping up with that hunger at the technology layer. Technology is not helping us very well because scaling is becoming very very difficult and almost ending in some areas and we have a bunch of different walls like memory, energy, reliability, complex, secured, scale. I don't like calling things walls but essentially these are bottlenecks that are significant uh, that we have in our systems. And th these are coupled with applications that's why you're seeing these hardware software co-designs because in a specialized domain you can tackle uh, the technology scaling difficulties much better and you can customize your technology to the application while hopefully avoiding some of these problems. Although all of these are fundamental, so how do you handle security in the self-driving chip, for example, is important. Now if you watch the video, there are some claims that it's secure, but you know, unless you provide very fundamental security primitives in hardware, I think it's very hard to get things to be extremely secure. Especially if things are operating in the field, like self-driving cars, right? People may have physical access to those devices, uh, too. Okay, I've already shown the slide at some point, but basically applications, I don't think at this point, uh, uh, if you remember when, when we talked about MIPS uh, and RISC architectures in digital circuits, uh, I gave you the uh, thinking in 1980s, and people were saying, who wants something faster than a MIPS processor? MIPS R2000 MIPS R processor, it's an in-order processor, very simple. It doesn't even have a floating point unit. Clearly, some people want something more than a MIPS processor. That's, and people are able to dream very well as and they can enable applications. So always believe in the applications. I think my, my motto is believe in the applications, believe in the dreamers, and believe in the technology also. Even though a technology may not look like it's going to happen, if you do your studies well, and you can, you can enable that technology to happen. And I think phase change memory is a good example of that. Okay. Clearly we have increasingly diverging complex trade-offs today also. Uh, you've seen this picture before also, ba basically a single uh, complicated operation, a computation costs a small amount of uh, energy compared to a memory access. Let's say a thousand X, or it could be anywhere between a hundred and thousand X. Actually, uh, I attended a bunch of conferences over the summer, but one of the conferences I attended was Design Automation Conference in June. And there was a special session on AI accelerators, or machine learning accelerators. People like calling this AI. I don't know why, but it's machine learning, let's say. Uh, and uh, some people from industry were giving numbers in terms of uh, the relative cost of computation versus memory access in their real accelerators. And clearly it's a huge issue in uh, machine learning accelerators. But one, one person gave the uh, example of 160x in their system, apparently. The DRAM access costs 160x uh, the energy cost of a floating point multiply and accumulate. And floating point multiply and accumulate is not a simple uh, operation. So even though it may not be 1000x, it's 160x, it's still pretty high. And that 160x varies depending on who you are. 
Okay, so clearly we have increasingly complex systems. Past systems were like this, now we have a lot more heterogeneity and a lot more trade-offs. So let's talk about the role of this course. Any questions so far? You've been listening very nicely and silently. Maybe you have some questions on what I showed? The chips? Yes? What's the key difference between a machine learning accelerator and the TPU? Oh! Well, I think TPU is a specific name that Google uses for their machine learning accelerator. It's called Tensor Processing Unit. I don't know if it's widely adopted by industry at this point. For example, uh, NVIDIA calls it Tensor Course. Right? Uh, I think Cerebras calls it Wafer Scale Engine. I don't think they use the name TPU anywhere. Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on and talk about this course a little bit. Uh, basically, hopefully we'll cover a bunch of fundamental and cutting edge research papers in computer architecture, and you'll be selecting them. Uh, well, we'll give you a pre-selected list, but you'll be selecting your preferences out of them. Uh, and hopefully we'll have multiple components that are aimed at improving your uh, technical skills in computer architecture for sure. Critical thinking and analysis, I think this is really important, even more so than the digital circuits. I mention this a lot in digital circuits. You should always think critically, but here you will actually exercise it with real presentations. And also, when somebody else presents, you can ask questions and we'll have a discussion. And of course, technical presentation. This is also important. You'll get to learn how to do a technical presentation uh, of concepts and papers. In both spoken and written forms, we'll have a written uh, evaluation in the end. And you'll get familiar with key research directions. Although if you've taken my digital circuits course, you're familiar with a, good, a lot of good ones, but this now we can, we can go broader. Uh, I think these are the, uh, this is the hope that I have in terms of improving uh, what, what I aim to improve. Anything that we should add here? Or is this good? Okay, if you think of something else, let me know. But the key goal in the end is this. Basically, I'd like you to learn how to rigorously analyze, present, and discuss papers and ideas in computer architecture. That's the key goal. Nothing else. <laughs> uh, and presentation comes in both written and uh, discussion and also uh, oral forms. Actually, all of them come in <laughs> all forms in the end. Okay, so let's talk about how to achieve that key goal. So there are steps for that the presenter who is going to present over here should follow and steps the participants who's going to be in the audience would follow. And at any given time there will be exactly one person here and exactly n minus one people over there. Hopefully. Hopefully everyone will attend, right? So for the presenter I think there's a lot of course. Uh, there's reading, absorbing and reading more other related words related to the paper that you're going to present. Critically analyzing, thinking and synthesizing and preparing a clear and rigorous talk and then presenting it answering questions and analyzing and synthesizing during the meeting, afterwards, online, and at the end of the course. Actually, that's true for participants also. Makes sense, hopefully, right? And for the participants, it's essentially discussion, asking questions. I would really like this to be interactive. I think last year when we had this in the same room, we had a very nice interactive group of students. We had very nice ideas also that came about. And students were actually very interested in getting their videos so that they can watch themselves after the presentation. We'll make them available if you're interested in that. We're not going to make them publicly available, but you can have your own video if you're interested. Uh, and asking questions and analyzing and synthesizing during the meeting and after and the course. And so if you read the papers actually, it's not required uh, that you read every single paper that's presented in this course, but you'll get a lot more out of the course clearly if you read the paper. That goes without saying. right? Of course the presenter needs to do more than reading just that paper so that they can actually present uh, the broader picture. Right. Okay, so these are the, some of the topics. Again, I don't want to go through this laundry list, but we're going to cover a lot of issues like hardware security acceleration, mechanisms, memory, interconnect, dot, 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 over here. And you'll see the paper list very soon so that you can select from it. There will be some... Uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll provide you with the instructions. So basically, uh, this is some of the goals. Think critically, think broadly and learn how to understand, analyze and present papers and ideas, get familiar with key steps in research, and get familiar with key research directions. This is a single goal kind of extended to multiple goals over here. And this is really how uh, uh, research actually operates in real life also. Uh, I mean, I mentioned this over here, but 
reading papers is really one way of getting into research very quickly. Because this is actually slides that I use uh, in my own reading group. I, I think I constructed these slides in 2009 or so. They're relatively old slides. Uh, the credit goes to Jim Laris, actually. Jim Laris wrote this paper uh, about Moore's Law. Spending Moore's Dividend. Uh, if you search for Spending Moore's Dividend, he, he's the dean at EPFL right now. He was at Microsoft Research uh, when I was at Microsoft Research. He, he wrote this paper and he had this virtuous cycle of processor performance. And basically he, he had the single core improvements and the software becoming more complex and then people are relying, uh, requiring even more software because performance is improving and then basically everything requires even more higher performance. You have this virtuous cycle because performance is improving, software is becoming more bulky and more complex, people want more, sof uh, more, more software uh, and more features in software and you require higher performance. And he said that now if this link is broken over here meaning that single core performance is not improving then you have a problem. That virtuous cycle the uh, industry is built on can collapse. That's what spending Moore's dividend was about. So I copied and pasted some of his boxes over here and adopted to my reading group. Basically, you start with reading and critiquing papers, understanding problems that way, uh, and you start questioning and brainstorming, questioning the paradigm, for example, that's how it happens, and you develop new out-of-the-box ideas, and you hopefully collaborate and work hard, that's the research part. That's not what you're going to do over here, but if you're interested in research, that's what you will likely do. And you do great research and publish and educate others and more, all of the good stuff that you need to do in great research. And that goes back to reading and critiquing papers <laughs> after that, because you actually created some more papers to read for someone else. Or, you, for, or on your own, actually, you can critique your own papers. If you can do this extremely well for your own papers, then you can do this loop on your own much better than anyone else can do, in my opinion. Okay, anyway, basically, I think in this course, we're going to cover some of this clearly. If we can get over here, that's good. But you can think of extending these steps uh, going forward. Okay, let me give you some course info on logistics. I think all of you know me, so I'm not going to belabor this stuff over here. Not much has changed since May. Uh, but we have a lot more TAs in this course. You're probably familiar with a lot of them, but there are some new faces. Uh, I guess I don't want to go through all of this list because not everyone is here. Actually, maybe I'll go through them. Juan is over there. Mohammed is somewhere hiding. Okay, he's not hiding. Uh, we have a bunch of teaching assistants uh, who are going to help you with the papers and presentations. Jawad, Luis, Jisung, Rahul, John. Nika, Hassan, Geraldo, Jeremy, Konstantinos, Minesh, and Girai. That's good. So hopefully you'll have uh, teaching assistants helping you with a lot of things. So please get to know them and their research also. You'll interact with them a lot uh, during the course. And they will be your mentors. You'll have to meet them actually at least twice before your presentations. And the goal is to really make your presentation better. If you don't meet them, I guarantee you uh, that your presentation will not be as good. Uh, so take this as an opportunity. <laughs> Okay, so this is uh, the requirements and expectations, basically. I think attendance is required for all meetings. That's part of your grade, as you will see. Hopefully you're not doing this for grade. I mean, a seminar course, grades don't matter as much, as you know. Uh, hopefully you'll take a lot more than a grade out of this. And everyone, each student presents one paper. Uh, with the help of the mentor, they prepare the presentation. And it's a full presentation, questions plus discussion. Non-presenters participate during the meeting, ask questions, contribute thoughts and ideas. And as I said, it's better if you read or skim the paper beforehand. Even better if you read it. Especially if you find something exciting, I'd suggest trying to read it. Uh, and everyone comments on papers and the online review system after the presentation. Do we have Piazza set up? Mohammed? So I set it up, but I didn't publish it. Oh, you didn't publish it, okay. Um, has anyone used Piazza before? Okay, do you like it as a forum for discussion? No. <laughs> Has anyone used Moodle before? Okay, do you like it as a forum for discussion? <laughs> okay. Is there a better forum for discussion? <laughs> I think there, uh, there are not a lot of ideas. We need some revolution in, in that space. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. So who prefers Piazza over Moodle? Okay, some people. Who prefers Moodle over Piazza? Okay, we have more people, wow. <laughs> okay, maybe we should go with Moodle. Anyway, we'll take that into account. 
Unless there's some other suggestion for a better forum for discussion, online discussion. Basically, I would like to encourage online discussion. In the past, there was a lot of good online discussion. And this is for your benefit. Really, frankly, this is really not going to determine a whole lot of your grade. It will really help it's, it's to give extra credit. As you will see, it's extra credit for participation, which is always helpful, as you know, from digital circuits, right? Uh, but I think this, you can benefit a lot uh, from this. Uh, it could even help you improve your presentations if you do it beforehand. And later you will write a synthesis report at the end, so asking questions related to the papers may help you. And okay, uh, yeah, that's what I said over here, writing a synthesis report at the end of the semester. And there's a sample synthesis report online, you can start studying it right now, so that you can figure out what kind of questions you will be expected to ask, uh, expected to answer. They're relatively simple, I think. But you will need to synthesize what you've seen in the entire course. Okay, uh, I think you have the website over here. Okay, I think you already know all of this from Digital Circuits. And homework zero is due next week. This is basic information about yourself. And now you know about the concept of predication. Everything is predicated on homework zero. If you don't submit it, you get zero grade. But again, I don't want to deal with grades that much. Uh, or about grades that much. But this is really important. I mean, this is also important because we really need to know you. But this is, uh, you, we, we will send papers out, a paper list, and we will expect you to give us your preferences in some order. I think we collected through Moodle, right? That's what we did last time. We'll probably do it again this time. And we really need this so that we can really schedule the presentations uh, and decide who gets which paper because there will be contention for some papers. Uh, certainly. That's why I will ask you to provide five preferences or so, depending on how many papers we have on the list. I'd suggest skimming the paper list uh, and then deciding which ones are most interesting to you. If you have time, you can read the abstracts of the papers also. That's always good, but of course there is not enough time. But you can get a good idea from the titles of the papers, clearly. Okay, so let's talk about how to deliver. Any, any questions? Yes? Uh, will we, we be notified once the list Yes, definitely. Yeah, you will know exactly mm, what you will present and when you will present it. So we'll have to schedule it, unfortunately. Otherwise, there is no way to deal with it. I actually meant a list for the papers that we have to give the preferences on. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we, you will be notified for sure, yes. Okay. Okay, so how to deliver a good talk. Let's talk about... Any other questions related to these logistics? We'll cover more logistics a little bit later, but... Okay. So this is the anatomy of a good paper talk or a review. Whenever you're reviewing a paper, whether it's written or uh, oral, I think it's very similar. In fact, whenever I'm writing a paper, I think of this outline also. Basically, you need to have titles, authors, and menu. Hopefully obvious, but a lot of people omit it, surprisingly. <laughs> but with these examples, you won't. Because people need to have an idea of where this is published, who are the authors. It's really important to give credit to the authors. Uh, and also recognize who they are. Uh, because that's really part of the paper. Summary, basically this, as I, I will show you an example of this, uh, either today or tomorrow, we'll see, or both. Uh, not tomorrow, next week. What is the problem the paper is trying to solve? What are the key ideas of the paper? What are the key insights? What are the key mechanisms? What is the implementation? What are the key results, key conclusions? Be basically, the, this will take some time, clearly. Uh, and then the next part, I, I will finish some of this and then we will uh, take a break. Strengths after that, the most important ones. Here you're critically analyzing the paper now. Does the paper solve the problem well? Is it well written? And I would order the strengths from the most important to the least important. The first one, the most important one comes first. Uh, whenever you're doing reviews, paper reviews is also important. Sometimes I get reviews for my papers. Not so important the concern is at the top. And then it's very out of order. Out of order scheduling is good in the microarchitecture, not in the ISA, <laughs> as you know, right? In the ISA, I expect something to be ordered nicely so that I can make sense out of it, right? What is really important first? Okay, that's two for weaknesses, also most important ones. And I think this is where you really need to think critically. Because strengths, those are easier. And also, usually, the authors want to <laughs> amplify the strengths, right? They, you, they tell you what, what is new about this paper, what is strong about this paper. Weaknesses, you may need to dig deeper to find out. Uh, so this is where you should really think critically. And every paper and idea is, has a weakness, at least one weakness. Usually many, many weaknesses actually, uh, small or large. This doesn't mean that the paper is necessarily bad. Uh, it just means that there's room for improvement for future work. There's no perfect thing in the world. There's no perfect paper. 
also. That's why you can identify this, and you can actually develop new ideas related to this, related to this, the area, if you think critically over here. And then thoughts and ideas, can you do better? Uh, I think this is actually a very good part of the discussion, potentially. And since we have an entire one hour, or 45-50 minutes, for, for any paper, we should have good discussion, so think about this well. Takeaways, what you learned, what you enjoyed, what you disliked about the paper. Again, most important to least important, that's always good. And then discussion starts and questions, because we'll have a discussion uh, about the paper. And it's again, the presenter's task is to uh, really start that discussion, ignite that discussion. If nobody's asking questions, maybe you should ask the question to the audience, for example. That's always a good way of starting discussion. And you should try to elicit an answer. <laughs> okay? Okay, well, if you're writing it, it's one page, but you're not writing it here. Uh, I, I will have a better breakdown over here, actually. That 20 minutes is already inconsistent with the next slide. But basically, this is uh, another view of this. Uh, you'll have a 25-minute summary, and then we'll have about 20-minute discussion. And if the discussion goes longer, that's fine. I don't intend to interrupt it, but I, I would like to have a break between the two talks. At least five minutes. Better 10 minutes. But if the discussion is really great, then uh, we'll, we'll reduce the break. Sorry. Okay. So you'll, you'll see these slides. Uh, let me finish with these advice on the paper review and talk, and then... Uh, should I keep going? Yes, I think let's, let's finish at a logically or semantically consistent place. We may have papers on uh, consistency also, especially in persistent memory. You really need to do things at, a, at consistent places, otherwise you may get into... Uh, uh, you may get into issues with consistency. Part of your data structure is updated, part of your data structure is not updated, and it's a non-volatile memory. You have a huge problem because your data structure is not consistent anymore. How do you satisfy that consistency? There are many, many methods that are proposed for that, uh, which we're not going to get into right now. Okay, let me give you some more advice over here. Basically, do, be very critical when you're reading the papers. Uh, don't think that the authors will be hurt. If they're hurt, they're not doing science. <laughs> Well, everybody gets hurt a little bit, but they, uh, they overcome the hurt part later on because this is really science in the end, right? And engineering. You really need to be critical. In fact, the authors should be the most critical ones on their own papers, in my opinion. Uh, and always think about better ways of solving the problem and related problems. This will enable you to think even broadly. And even, who knows, maybe you can generate the next big idea. Question the problem as well. Sometimes the problem may not be... Uh, that good, right? Or a problem may be obsolete right now if you're thinking about the thinking about historical work. Or maybe the paper sold the problem so well that the solution is adopted and no one else is doing anything in that area anymore. That's also possible. And we, I would suggest reading the background papers, both past and future, at least skimming over some of them. That will help you understand the paper as much as possible. Uh, and again, this is how things progress in science and engineering, how you can make big leaps, by this critical analysis and critical nature. Uh, this is, this is, you can apply this globally and locally, in a single paper and also globally across pieces of work as well. Uh, and a few sample text reviews are provided online. I think you've already seen this actually uh, in digital circuits, so it'll be the same. Have you seen this in digital circuits? I haven't showed this, I think, yet. Maybe I will include them. These are rat holes, if you don't know what they are. A rat hole is a hole on, in the ground where a rat resides. That's the definition of the rat hole. And <laughs> clearly this is a specific rat hole. Uh, you, uh, these are the rat holes in performance analysis. I like drawing this picture actually, uh, sometimes, uh, to my PhD students. Uh, if, if the discussion goes on in an endless loop. And usually four things lead to rat holes. Like whenever we're discussing, uh, you can always question the workload and you can have an endless debate on workload. Does this idea work on this workload X, Y, Z, T, U? Endless because workloads are endless. And endless because you don't have the answer. Because there's only one way to get the answer. Doing the experiment with that workload. But then there will be another workload. And then another workload. And then another workload. That's why this is a rat hole. And this is the biggest rat hole actually. This picture doesn't do justice to it. I'm going to show you a better picture in the next slide or so. Metrics is always a question. Did, is this thing evaluated with the right metric? What about this metric? What about this other metric? What about this other metric? 
And again, you can reason about this a little bit better perhaps. You can reason about the workload also. You can always try to reason how a technique will be work on workload, but the definitive answer comes from the experiment in the end. Metrics also are similar. You can reason about how this will affect this metric, this metric, this metric. Some metrics are easier than others, clearly. Power, performance, thermal, reliability, security. You can add a lot of these, scalability. But this is also an endless discussion. It's, it's good to point out these things uh, more. Maybe the paper didn't really cover the right metrics, for example, right? But then move on, because we cannot do much about it in the end. You can reason a little bit, but in the end, the definitive study comes from the experiment. Right? Configuration, this is also a harder one. Actually, metrics is, I think, better than uh, configuration, but somehow the author of this textbook thinks metrics is worse. Uh, configuration, but, but there's a reason for it. If you read the book, uh, you will see that. Configuration, this is also an endless thing, right? You've evaluated system X. What about system X++? plus plus? What about system Y? What about system Z? And you can imagine the search space here. It's endless in the end. And you can always poke holes related to this. I think the solution to this is, so certainly if it's a terrible configuration, you should point that out in the review. It's always good to point out. Or if the configuration can become better, uh, it's also good to point out. But it's very hard to uh, uh, get out of the rat hole if you harp on this configuration a lot. And then details, of course, this, that's, uh, this is a bit uh, a catch-all kind of rat hole. It catches all the other rat holes over here that cannot reside over here. Anyway, basically this is taken from this book. Uh, has anyone seen this book or studied it? I think, I think one of your TAs has studied it. It's a good book. It's uh, the, uh, the, art of uh, yeah, the Art of Computer Systems Performance Analysis by Rod Jane. And it has a lot of really nice computer system performance analysis techniques, queuing theory, for example, scheduling theory, and a bunch of other stuff. But it has these rat holes also. This is where the rat holes come from. As you can see, workload, metrics, configuration, detail. And there's a context to it, actually, which we will also cover probably later on during the discussions. But I would recommend actually reading this book and reading some parts of it. For example, I'll, I'll, I'm going to read this because I think this is very instructive. It's not as technical as other parts of the book, clearly. But in the end, whenever you're doing performance analysis and presenting it, which most papers we're going to cover will do, some, for some metric of performance. It could be energy, it could be power, it could be security. You always get questions. Right? And in the end, you're doing this for a purpose. The goal is to have a decision maker make a decision. Right? If you're doing this for science, the decision maker is the reviewers. If you're doing this for some pro something that you want to influence, a product, for example, the decision maker is the person who is going to make that decision to adopt your idea for that product. So this is very general, actually. You go to business, you'll actually need to handle this also because you're going to make a presentation, you're going to uh, suggest that your idea is good and you're going to try to convince people based on evidence that your idea is going to work out if they adopt it in their, uh, in their next generation technology that they're going to roll out in the bank, for example, or wherever you go. It's very fundamental in the end. And in the end, the decision maker, in this case he says games, they can play games on you, but you can think of it's not a bad game. You can think of it as a game theory also, right? In the end, you're optimizing for something. You're trying to get, achieve an outcome. But basically, this says, even if the performance analysis is correctly done and presented, it may not be enough to persuade your audience, the decision makers, to follow your recommendations. The list shown in box 10.2, which is the next page, is a compilation of reasons for rejection heard at various performance analysis presentations. You can use the list by presenting it immediately and pointing out that the reason for rejection is not new, and that the analysis deserves more consideration. Also, the list is helpful in getting the competing proposals rejected. So now you have another <laughs> ammunition for <laughs> getting your competing proposals rejected. I don't recommend that, of course, but, <laughs> but I mean, this is, uh, this is a very nice writing style, I think. I like it. Uh, there's no clear end of an analysis. Any analysis can be rejected simply on the grounds that the analysis requires more analysis. You cannot see it, but the problem needs more analysis. And that's the first reason. The second most common reason for rejection and uh, rejection of an analysis and for endless debate is the workload. Since workloads are always based on the past measurements, their applicability to the current or future environments can always be questioned. And you know that from digital circuits, right? We're designing for the future and you're testing with current workloads, you're fundamentally broken in a sense. Because you don't know what the workloads exactly will be five years down the road, right? That's, that's the difficulty of design uh, for the future. Uh, Okay. Actually, workload is one of the four areas of discussion that lead to a performance presentation into an endless debate. 
these rat holes and their relative size in terms of the time consumed are shown in figure 10.26. Now you can question the methodology that he has, right? I don't know how he, how he got the size of these rat holes over here. But I like these rat holes, regardless. Even though the sizes may be wrong, I think the points are good. Uh, presenting this cartoon at the beginning of a presentation helps to avoid these areas. I've never done it, but at some point we may need to do it. Okay, and these are the reasons. For example, this needs more analysis, you need a better understanding of the workload. These are reasons for not accepting the results of an analysis. I think some of them are really interesting, and these are real, actually. I mean, some of them are not as applicable because this is written in 1980s or so, late 1980s. Like I, I to plea, NC, dot, 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 even those standards. Basically, this violates some standard is one reason for rejection. I like this last one. Why change? It's working okay. <laughs> I think it's a terrible mindset. But you see this mindset everywhere, actually. Hopefully not in this class. <laughs> Because change, for example, I think this mindset was present when we wrote our first phase change memory paper. That's an example from my own personal uh, thing. When we wrote our row hammer paper, one of the, reason, uh, one of the uh, reasons for rejection was uh, that's not a problem in realistic DRAM usage. Well, it's kind of like why changes work okay, right? Flash memory, for example. Why do research on flash memory? It's working okay. What we have, the disks are working okay. Clearly, if you have this mindset, you cannot enable things like this. And I think if, uh, uh, even if it's working okay, maybe there is a better way of working. Uh, and all of the designs that I showed you from 2019 uh, didn't have this mentality. They basically wanted to push the change. And always, change always comes with extra cost, as we mentioned. The cost is always present. So if the cost could be one of the reasons over here as well, and I think it's one of them, but I cannot point out which one. Oh yeah, there you go. Something is cheap. It needs too much memory. It, basically, it's, it's too expensive. It's somewhere over there. So all of these are actually reasons for rejection, but they're not necessarily good reasons for rejection. Let me give you some more advice. This actually is a, a, a talk uh, advice that I recommend from my former colleague, k uh, who was at CMU. Uh, and... Uh, I recommend going through these clear talking tips because I uh, really agree with most of them. Uh, but every sentence matters. It's actually true for writing also. Whenever you write something, every sentence, actually every dot matters. If you place the dot wrong, maybe somebody can interpret the sentence wrong. The audience prefers not to think. That's true for the reader also. Nobody prefers to think actually. You just need to guide them the right way. Uh, actually, this is true especially for the decision makers that were mentioned in the previous slides. Decision makers, you can guarantee that that decision maker is a very busy person. You can assume that they're smart, but you really need to get your point without requiring them to think much. And that's true for any kind of reader as well. And this is surprise are bad. Say why before what. This is actually very important, when you're, especially when you're writing papers. The high level goal is extremely important. You have to set that first and only after that you can go into the implementation and the mechanism. If you start with the implementation right away, people are going to stop reading what you've written. Because they have no context about what you're talking. Right? There are actually very interesting studies in psychology related to this. Uh, people, uh, there was a text that was provided uh, in cognitive psychology. Uh, some people did a lot of experiments related like this. Uh, basically, they provide some text. The text doesn't have a title, no context. You provide the text to the people, uh, and later you test how much of the text they remember. And this is one group. And the other group, the control group, they're given the title and exactly the same text. And you figure out that this group remembers a whole lot more compared to this group who, has not, who were not given the title. Even though they read exactly the same thing minus the title. And that title provides a high level context. Okay, explain every figure, graph, or equation. This is really important. These are actually fundamental rules for not just speaking, but also writing. Uh, now, some companies violate that very heavily. Uh, I like joking about Intel's graphs. Intel's graph have no ex access values. But they do it for hiding information, of course. They don't want to give out their trade secrets. Just don't do that in science. <laughs> uh, when improving the talk, the audience is always right. Uh, so keep that in mind. If the audience doesn't understand something, Yes, you can say that they weren't paying attention, but why were they not paying attention, right? Maybe you were not presenting as good. <laughs> okay, I think this is good to keep in mind. This is some of the things that I selected over here uh, related to uh, in, in this particular PDF. And I like this example from that talk. Does anybody know who this is? 
No one? No one has seen this before? No one Spanish? Well, some, uh, some Spanish people I know have seen it before, so they should not talk. <laughs> okay? So this is not Salvador Dali. <laughs> this is a picture that he painted when he, was, when he looked like this. When he was young, basically. In 1924, apparently. And this is a picture that he painted much later when he went crazy. I wouldn't argue that this is crazy when he went more creative, let's say. And this is a very famous picture, as you can see, right? This is the burning giraffe. And there are a bunch of really, really fascinating uh, paintings by Salvador Dali. So what's my point? Basically, learn the basic principles before you consciously choose to break them. So even Dali started with something basic. Everybody starts with something basic. And then you start becoming more confident and you start adding more stuff into it and you, you can start consciously breaking them. So it's good to uh, abide by the principles. Okay, how to participate. Uh, I think this may be a good place to take a break. What do you think? Okay, shall we continue? So I'm going to finish the logistics uh, and then we're going to uh, be done today. We're going to do the lecture, uh, sample review example ne next week. It's good for you to see some sample reviews so that you can, s you can calibrate uh, and see how you should do the reviews. Okay, this is the participation part of it. I think this is, uh, how, t how do you make the best out of this course? Uh, I think coming prepared is useful. Reading and critically evaluating the paper, certainly for the person who's presenting it, but other people can benefit a lot from it also. Thinking new ideas bringing discussion points and questions, reading other papers, uh, being critical, brainstorming, be open to new ideas, as I said. Don't be one of those people who says, why change, it's okay. They're, they're the backward force, not the forward force. Uh, certainly paying attention, I think it's important. That, that way you can participate, right? Discussing and contributing. And participating online, I think, would be good also, because that way you can have a continuous discussion. We'll try to, if it's possible, We'll try to schedule papers that are kind of related together so that hopefully the discussion becomes deeper. But it's not always possible uh, depending on the paper selections. Okay, so let's talk about guided talk preparation. This is something that we expect. Uh, it really looks like this. Basically, how do you prepare a talk? First of all, you need to know your presentation date. Uh, once you know that, you can start studying your papers. Uh, you can create uh, well, basically, preparing a good presentation takes time. Even, be, even after you know that, you can do stuff. Basically, start early. That's what I would suggest. Don't leave it. Well, you cannot leave it, based on what I'm going to write over here. You cannot leave it uh, to the last day. Because at the last day, you're not going to be able to get the mentors to help you. But don't leave it uh, even a week uh, before their presentation. Because, again, mentors will, will require some at least a week. But I think it's good to do it even earlier. Of course, the uh, people who are going to present first will be at a disadvantage. We'll take that into account. Uh, it's not always a disadvantage because we have a buffer time uh, of a couple of weeks before we start the presentations. Okay, so starting early is important. I think study your papers. Uh, read your papers carefully, critically, and creatively, hopefully. Uh, look up terms, possibly read cited papers. It's always good. Or maybe papers that cite this paper. I've seen students present work that was published, let's say, in 2012, and they say, oh, this work in 2016 improves on it this way. So that's always good if you actually know what, has, what comes after and also what comes before. And creatively, I think that's also important. Think of improvements. This way you can also uh, develop yourself. Uh, and who knows, maybe you can contribute, right? Try examples by hand if you can. It's not always possible. Uh, not with all papers, but some papers it's possible where you get the source code. So with the Rohammer paper, if that's presented, for example, you can try the source code and see what happens. Right? And it's not that hard, I think. It's very easy. If the tool is available, try it. Uh, and consult with TAs if you have any questions related to the papers. TAs are... Uh, there will be two assigned TAs for each uh, paper, meaning each student. Then you can actually take, essentially use them as a resource who can help you. And TA is like this creative thinking uh, and critical thinking for sure. Okay, after that you create a draft presentation. Clearly, as I discussed earlier, 
I don't think I need to go through that again. Yeah, I think uh, basically do not present all the details is important though. <laughs> Clearly you don't have time to present all the details, but distill the key things. Don't be too shallow, but don't be extremely deep also. Because you cannot be extremely deep, you cannot present every single result in the paper. But if you're too shallow, that's also not good. Because people need to get an idea of what, what is the result, right? What is the mechanism? Uh, and you need to strike that balance nicely. Uh, you will see that in my uh, example presentation. In the end, it's an art. It's a balance that you're trying to strike. Uh, too shallow talks are for uh, not so interesting technical conferences. <laughs> Here, <laughs> we have a better bar. Okay, uh, and then meet the uh, mentor, advisor, and get feedback, basically. I think prepare for the meeting. It's uh, your responsibility to schedule the meeting. Uh, schedule it early, send slides in advance, write down questions. Basically, I would come prepared for the meeting. Ask questions that you may have, both in terms of the presentation and the paper. In terms of the paper, the mentor may not be able to answer all the questions, clearly, uh, if it's not their paper. Uh, if it's their paper, they should hopefully answer all the questions. But you may think of something new that they haven't thought about also. Right? Don't discount that possibility ever. Uh, and make sure you address the feedback. Take notes. I would suggest taking notes during every meeting so that you don't forget about the feedback. Uh, because reviewers don't like it when their feedback are not, is not addressed. This is, this is for sure uh, a reality of life. Or at least discuss the feedback. Right? If, the, if you don't agree with the feedback, it's always good to discuss with the feedback. That's, that's, that's perfect to find. Uh, and meetings are mandatory. At least one week before the talk. Uh, two meetings. Uh, so that you can iterate. And I think this will be helpful for you. This is really for you. And this is also for everyone because no one wants to listen to a bad presentation, right? Okay. Even from bad presentations, you can take things out if you have the right mindset. But if it's a good presentation, it's much better. It's a much better experience. Okay, grading and feedback. Let's uh, talk about this. Basically, this is the rubric for grading. As you can see, it's very simple. Quality of the presentation is most of the grade. Quality of the synthesis paper is a reasonable chunk. Attendance, hopefully, should be the easiest part. Uh, although, if you cannot attend one or two lectures, please let me know. One is more acceptable than two, but if you have good reasoning, you should let us know. Uh, and participation is also important. There's a bonus that we can give. Clearly, you'll get a grade out of 100, but you have the opportunity to go up to 110, as you can see. Okay, I mean, clearly, there, the presentation is good if you show that you understand the material, if you're comfortable presenting it, if you answer the questions well. Answering the questions is an important part. These are, this is the harder part, actually, but it's an important part. Be prepared to explain everything, basically, technical terms. And clearly, we will take into account the difficulty of the paper and the time you had to prepare. Not all papers are equally difficult. Some papers are much more difficult for the writing style, the subject matter. Some papers are easier. Sometimes you don't have time to prepare because you're the first one to present. So we'll take that into account. Uh, and in the end, grading is not going to be uh, as strict as we have uh, in digital circuits because it's not an exam, right? I'll try to, if you have a good presentation, you can expect to get a good grade, no question. Well, this is also important, as you can see. Uh, so this is important. You can, you can study this online and take a look at it so that you can have an understanding and participation. Uh, actually, this should not be here. That's really part of attendance, so we should delete this. Did you attend all sessions in the, inside the participation part? Basically, did you participate? And good questions, I think almost all questions are good questions. <laughs> Okay, uh, so we will also try to briefly discuss strengths and weaknesses of your talk uh, in class, right at the spot. Let us know up front if you'd prefer, you don't want that. We didn't do that as much last year because we didn't have as much time. Uh, but if you, uh, you, will, uh, you can also arrange a meeting with your TA to get feedback, or you can uh, contact me personally to, if you want to get feedback uh, on your talk. And we'll record them, so if uh, if, if, if I'm not present, for example, I'll watch the recordings and you can get feedback from me after I watch the recordings. Okay, so this is the expected schedule. Let's see, uh, we'll meet once a week, clearly, with two presentations per session. Next meeting is this next week, right, hopefully. Yes, but you will not, going, you will not present September 26. Uh, I will present during that time, a sample presentation. And you're present uh, actually, maybe we'll point you to a video because this is the next week after that, right? Okay, 
So for the, or those of you who are presenting on October 3rd, you may want to actually watch the video of my presentation from last year. I have two example presentations uh, that essentially show how you should present, uh, well, that essentially provide the guidelines on how you should structure your presentation. We just don't have time for it today because I talk too much about the new developments in computer architecture, which are exciting. Uh, but I think you can watch the video and you can get a good idea. And we'll, we'll have 22 presentations total. Each presentation is about 50 minutes, including questions. Well, not the presentation itself. Everything related to the presentation. The presentation itself should be 25 minutes. Okay, if you push it, maybe 30 minutes. But the rest of the 50 minutes should go into discussion and brainstorming. And as I said, paper assignment, we will do it online. Study the list of papers and check your email and be responsive, please. Uh, because it's going to be a tight schedule in the end. We have 11 slots and 22 presentations. Now you do the math, there's no slack basically. <laughs> there's slack to next week, but I don't think anyone here wants to present next week, right? Probably not. Okay, good. Okay, as I said, uh, we want this information about yourself and by next week, and we want the review pre preferences next week. So how are the first group of people going to present if we want the review preferences next week? <laughs> I should ask this to Mohammed because he supplied these dates. <laughs> Maybe we should get these num uh, earlier, right? I would suggest by the end of the weekend. Okay? Does that sound like a good schedule? So we're going to pull the deadlines earlier, sorry, so that we can accommodate the schedule. Basically, you can study the paper list. Uh, yes? Um, the new date is fine by me if the list of papers is also published quite quickly. Yes, that's what, that's what we intend to do. Basically, hopefully we'll publish it tomorrow, and then you'll have two days. Maybe we'll do it t Tuesday, so that you'll have f uh, Monday also. Okay? Otherwise, people who are presenting at, on October 3rd will be at a disadvantage if we do it too late. Okay? So the new date is then, what is it? 24th. That's a bit better than 26th. Certainly a bit better. If you're presenting on October 3rd. Okay. I think that's all I have today. We don't have time for the review. Uh, if, I, I would suggest watching the review anyway. Uh, that might be useful. Because I'm going to do the same thing. Unless I select a different paper. But we'll see. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll send those links uh, through the Moodle. Okay, any questions? Everything is clear, perfect. Nobody wants to drop the course. <laughs> you don't need to tell me anyway, you can, you can do it. Okay, and I'll see you next week. Take care.